We're going to start in Hebrews chapter 4, if you want to get a head start on everybody else, Hebrews chapter 4. Thank you. And Father, we dedicate our givers to you, each and every one that's given in the various electronic ways or here in these baskets. We thank you, Father, for giving them the desires of their hearts, opening the windows of heaven unto them, that your blessings overtake and overwhelm them. Thank you, Father, for great joy, for you said, ask and you would receive that your joy would be full. So I ask for great joy in all of our givers' lives. Let them experience breakthrough and increase. Let them experience the moving of your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's just take our Bibles and we'll make our faith declaration. And then I'd have you turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Say it with me. Through this word, I will grow. By this word, I will triumph. In this word is my future. This word is real life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews chapter 4. Now, recently I've gotten a lot of questions, a lot of different people asking me various things about translations. Um, you know, what translation is better than another? Um, are there, you know, I, I've heard, and the person who was asking me a question said that they uh, have heard a pastor that says, you know, we use the King James Version and only the King James Version because that's the truth. And um, I, have, I use the King James Version, but I use some others as well, as I'll tell you about. Um, then others have asked me about the veracity of the word. Can we trust the word? Can we believe that it's true? How do we know? And so uh, this evening I decided to do, do a message called Understanding Our Bible. And I'm going to uh, go through the writing of it, why we should have confidence in it, the application of it in our lives, and the study of the Bible. And we're going to look at all those four things. But first, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, For the word of God is alive and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The basically just says that the Word of God is alive, and we know that Jesus is the Word, so we know He's the living Word. And it's sharp. It divides. Now, soul and spirit. A lot of people confuse the soul and the spirit. A lot of people think that the soul is the spirit, or the spirit is the soul. It's not. The spirit is the man on the inside, the woman on the inside, who we are on the inside. That's the spirit. We have a soul, a mind, will, emotions. That's the soul. And we live in a body, our physical body. Now, our soul many times thinks one thing. Our spirit always thinks God's thoughts because that's how the spirit of God communes with us through our spirit. So there will be times when our mind is in one direction, our spirit in another. And we're unsure which is God and which isn't. And that's where the Word of God comes in, divides between soul and spirit. So we know, oh, this is the soul. This is what our mind is thinking. This is God. This is what the Spirit is showing our spirit. The Bible was written over a 1,400-year period by over 40 writers. Of course, we know not 40 authors, 40 writers. The Holy Spirit is the author. He moved upon all the different writers to coordinate so if you think about that, 1,400 years, 40 different people writing this, and yet it all goes together, fits together, and works together, you know it's something miraculous, something of God. The Old Testament, of course, written in Hebrew, but also in Aramaic. There are two portions written in Aramaic. One is from Daniel, one is from Ezra. Both those portions were written in 400 to 500 B.C., and uh, that was after the Babylonian captivity, and that's probably why they were written in, in Aramaic. Um, then... Um, Around uh, 200 to 300 B.C., it was all translated into Greek. And that's what, if you've ever heard of the Septuagint, that was the translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into, of course, it was only, wasn't the Old Testament then, it was the only testament, uh, translated into Greek about 200 to 300 B.C., called the Septuagint. Uh, the New Testament, written in Greek, but also a little bit of Aramaic in that as well. Aramaic was probably the language that Jesus spoke, the vernacular of the day, Aramaic. The uh, highly educated would speak Greek as well. Uh, they were shocked when they heard the Apostle Paul speaking Greek. Now, for somebody like Jesus, who was speaking to normal farmers and fishermen, he would speak in Aramaic, but at the same time, he would know Hebrew because the 
Hebrew scriptures were in Hebrew. And every good, well-educated um, male, let's say, young men, they would go to Hebrew school so they would know the Hebrew as well, but they were not speaking Hebrew in the time of Jesus. They were speaking Hebrew in the Old Testament times, but not in the time of Jesus. So the New Testament written in Greek. Now there are some uh, still, and I'll just point out if you're taking notes, some places where you can actually see the Aramaic words in the New Testament. Mark chapter 5, verse 41, Talitha kumi. Talitha kumi, when Jesus speaks to the young girl, it's translated exactly what he said, Talitha kumi, that's Aramaic. And uh, even in today's Arabic, Aramaic is kind of a, an ancestor of today's Arabic, uh, in today's Arabic, tal, talitha tal, means come. And he was telling the little girl to get up. And if you say tali, that's come to me in Arabic today. Talitha, He's, the E on there is come to me, come, come awake. So that is one of the places. Mark 15, 34, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Uh, Psalm 22, beginning of Psalm 22. He, that's quoted word for word. That's an Aramaic. Uh, another place is uh, John 19, verse 13, Gabatha. Anybody know the, the word Gabatha? That was the pavement, Gabatha. That is an Aramaic word. And the last one I want to point out is John 19, verse 17, Golgotha. That's also an Aramaic word. So those words were brought directly into the Greek New Testament, but they, they gave us the Aramaic. So that's another clue to what Jesus was speaking and what everybody was speaking at, <clears throat> speaking at the time. Can, now, can we trust it? Um, I'm going to turn to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. And a, this is a very, very important statement for us as believers. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. I'll continue this in a moment. Now, if you think today of some of the cults that exist, they are cunningly devised fables. Uh, for example... You all know the name Joseph Smith, Mormonism. Joseph Smith said that he found these golden tablets, and the only way he could interpret them was by looking through gigantic spectacles, so big that you can only look through one side at a time. And then the angel Moroni, rhymes with macaroni, so it must be Italian, the angel Moroni of course, he's not the only Italian angel. Malachi is the other one. You know, Malachi is also Malachi. Uh, but Moroni, he, he tells him the interpretation. Now, he was challenged at the time, and when he produced some of the symbols, some were Egyptian hieroglyphics, some were Greek letters, some were Hebrew letters. It was just a mishmash of things put together. And um, you all know that he was, before that time, before he actually did all this, he had been arrested in Vermont for fraud. And then following that, he was arrested in Ohio. And in Ohio, the people were so enraged that they, they rushed the jail to lynch him. And he had a concealed weapon. He pulled out a pistol and killed several of them. And uh, before, and got, I'm, I'm not sure if he got away or they killed him. But anyway, it was then his followers that went out to Utah after that. But uh, I don't see anywhere in the Bible where Jesus killed anybody. You know, it, it, so here, a cunningly devised fable. But here we go. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we make known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. They're saying we were eyewitnesses. Now, um, how many of you ever heard of Julius Caesar? Right? We all know Julius Caesar. Well, there are only 250 copies of his works, of his writings, in, ex in existence, 250 copies. And the oldest copy is 950 years after Julius Caesar wrote them, after he died. 950 years, that's the oldest copy. And yet, who today would pick up a copy of Julius Caesar's wars or Julius Caesar, uh, anything that he wrote, and say, mm, that's, I, don't, I don't trust that, I don't think that's really him. No, everybody accepts this is what he wrote. 250 copies, 950 years after he wrote them. How about anybody? Now, here's a tougher one. Julius Caesar was the easy one. I want to start with an easy one. Herodotus. Anybody know who Herodotus was? Herodotus. Of course, Paul knows. Herodotus, he's called the father of history. He was a Greek historian. And um, his history, there's only 110 copies of his histories. 110. And the 
the, uh, the oldest one is from 1,400 years after Herodotus. And yet when I was in university, they taught this is Herodotus and he wrote it. And I had to study that in uh, my Greek studies. How about Homer? Another easy one. Everybody know who's, knows who Homer is? Homer. Okay. Homer, there are 1,800, 1,800 copies of the Iliad or the Odyssey, the two books that he penned. And uh, I don't have the dates on those, but because there's 1,800, they fed all this into a computer, and the computer came out with this statistic that it's 95% accurate that this is by Homer and that this is uh, from start to finish, no additions, no subtractions. They compared, they fed all these 1,800 copies into a computer, 95% accurate. Now, the New Testament. People will tell you the New Testament can't be trusted because it's been copied. And, you know, and I talked, I've talked about this other times in relation to the Dead Sea Scrolls. But the New Testament, there are over 5,000 copies. Over 5,000. And the, the distance between Jesus and the first copies of the New Testament, the earliest ones are 100 years later. And between 100 and 300 years later. Okay, Julius Caesar, 950 years later. Uh, Herodotus, 1,400 years later. Gospels, 100 years later. So the chances of them being accurate and all of this fed into that same computer that came out with, her, with uh, Homer being 95% accurate, that computer says that the New Testament is 99.5% accurate. 99.5% accurate. So, when Peter says, we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we make known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we are eyewitnesses, we are hearing from people who actually witnessed the miracles, witnessed the teaching, listened to and heard the teaching, and passed it on to us because they thought it was so important that generation after generation know what he said, what he did, and who he is. I'm going to turn to James chapter 1. And in James chapter 1, <clears throat> James chapter 1, verse 22. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And we know these, all these scriptures, but how in the world are we to be doers of the word of God? That's the Bible. If the Bible is indeed the word of God, we are commanded to be doers of it, to act upon it. So I want to give you four points to be a doer of the Word of God. First of all, number one, make it personal. Make it personal. If you would see how many times in the Gospels Jesus personalized the prophecies. Now, of course, they were about him, and he personalized, he, but he taught it by making them understand this is what you're experiencing now. This is what you're hearing and seeing now. We do the same. God's word is alive. We started there. Now, if it's alive, we want that life. We already have resurrection life. That's the life that brought Jesus out of the tomb. We have that. When we're born again, he gives us resurrection life. We feed that resurrection life with the life or the living word of God. And so we personalize it. You can take a scripture, Psalm 112. Psalm 112 says things like, I will not be afraid of, well, it doesn't say I will not be afraid. It says not to be afraid of evil tidings. My heart is fixed trusting in the Lord. Personalize that. I will not be afraid of evil tidings. My heart is fixed trusting in the Lord. Now you personalize that. You say that. You hold on to that. You meditate upon that. You read it to yourself. You say it on the inside. And then when the first thing that comes along that is some sort of a fearful thought, you have that word as a weapon. Jesus had the word of God as the weapon when the enemy came to tempt him the three various ways in the wilderness. He was demonstrating to us how to use the word of God personally. It wasn't just he, him that overcomes the evil one. We overcome the evil one by the blood of the lamb, which he did for us, and the word of our testimony. So we personalize that. 
By whose stripes ye were healed. 2 Peter 2.20, 1 Peter 2.24. By whose stripes ye were healed. You personalize that. I'm healed by his stripes or by his wounds. The stripes meaning wounds. You take the word of God. Personalize it for yourself. You make it yours. It belongs to us. Make it yours. Number two, make it practical. Make it practical. What can you practically do to act upon that word? What can you do to act upon the word of God? Well, let's, let's take another example. The word of God says, I'll put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So why do we go around with a spirit of heaviness? Why would we be depressed? Why would we allow that to linger upon us? The word of God says, put on the garment of praise. So that means we actually put that on. It doesn't mean that we have something in our closet that we put on. But it means that we, it's a physical act, something we do. We choose to strip away that depression and put on praise. So you might want to put on the radio. You might want to, and I'm talking about Christian radio, you might want to put on something that's with some praise music so that you can begin to get that into your spirit, into your heart, into your mind. And you'll find that depression will start to slip away. In the New Testament, the Word of God says to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is an act of our will. We're going to put on Jesus. You know, when, uh, when you put on Jesus, people see and people know. And it's, it's good for us to know that we're wearing him. We have him visible because it helps us to stay in line. I was years and years ago, Pastor Mary Beth and I were first married. I had this old car and I put a, a Jesus bumper sticker on the back. But it was a, I can't remember, it was, it was the shape of a fish, I think, a Jesus bumper sticker. And I had it on the back bumper. I don't have any bumper stickers now, by the way. But in those days, I had the Jesus bumper sticker. And one day, I, uh, I got really angry at somebody on the road, you know, somebody kind of like all the people that drive around here. And I got, I got really upset. And I was, gonna, I was just going to zoom in front of them, you know, and do the thing that people do. And uh, I realized, you know what? If I cut this guy off, he's going to think Jesus cut him off because he's going to see my Jesus bumper sticker. And, I, and it really changed the way I drove. Now, I mentioned already, I don't have any bumper stickers now, but it changed the way I drove back then. Because I didn't want people to think, oh, there goes one of those Jesus people. Look how they drive. Anyway, and don't anybody get me any Jesus bumper stickers. No, I heard it. That was probably a word of knowledge, Ken. The Spirit of God just told me to say, don't get it. Make it practical. What can you do? When you put on Jesus, people are going to see him. And they're going to judge the Lord by your actions, by your words, by your attitude. When people know that we're believers, you know they're going to sort of test us a little bit. When unbelievers, they're going to try to test you. And when you've put on Jesus, it's an act of your will. You put him on, that means that you say what he would say. You do what he would do. You act like he would act. So make it practical. Number three, make it purposeful. If you are going to act upon the word of God, there must be some purpose, some outcome. What is the outcome you desire? You determine the outcome. Putting on the garment of praise, it's not, the outcome is not just to praise God. The outcome is a changed heart. The outcome is to release yourself from that depression. The outcome is to live a life above the circumstance and not below. The Apostle Paul said, I've learned to be content in whatsoever state I'm in. And literally, in the Greek, that means I've learned to be independent of the circumstances. We, a lot of us, need to learn that, independent of the circumstances. So, what is the purpose of that scripture? What is the, why do you want to personalize that scripture? Why do you want to act upon that scripture? Why do you want to be a doer? What is the outcome? What do you see happening? The outcome may be healing. Pastor Mary Beth mentioned already about my healing it was 16 years ago. And uh, the surgeons, as she said, they said, you have a very serious, very advanced stage of cancer that we cannot remove at all. The only hope we have, and they said that word, hope, the only hope we have of keeping you alive is massive radiation and massive chemotherapy. But the same night, it was a Monday night, the Lord spoke to me, two scriptures, both from the book of Psalms. You shall live and not die and declare the wonderful works of God. Now, he didn't say hope. He said, you shall. 
He's very positive. God is positive. You shall live and not die and declare the wonderful works of God. For I sent my word and healed you and delivered you from all destruction. And again, he didn't say might. He didn't say maybe. He didn't say if. He said it. Very direct, very positive. So I took those to be mine. He spoke them. He gave them to me. I personalized them. I began to say over and over, I shall live and not die and declare the wonderful works of God. For he sent his word and healed me and delivered me from all destruction. The next day, which was a Tuesday, the surgeons came in and they said, you know, it's, it's critical. We need to start right away, but you're too weak. We can't start any treatment. We need to stabilize you. Introduced me to a radiation doctor. Next day, Wednesday, same thing. Thursday morning, the three of them walk in the room, the two surgeons, the radiation doctor, and they have these odd looks on their faces. And the one says, there's been a remarkable turn of events. The other says, we have some very, very good news for you. And the radiation doctor said, this is a real head scratcher. We don't understand it. But there's cancer's not in your body any longer. You're cancer free. The next day I was released from the hospital. Now, that was the death sentence on Monday, released from the hospital on Friday. But the battle had been for a year prior to that. So I don't want anybody to think that if you don't get it in a week, you don't get it. No, I've been battling in prayer for a year. That week was the deciding week, though. When God moves, he moves, and he moves according to his word. That's why we want to get a purpose. Why are we believing the scripture? Why are we speaking the scripture? Why are we holding fast to confession of our faith? What is the outcome? That we're looking to. And then number four, provable. Provable. Provable means there's a result that, that shows the word of God. You, you, you see it. You see it and you have a time period. It's not open-ended. You know, open-ended is like, well, in the sweet by and by. That's open-ended. Open-ended would be when Jesus said to uh, Martha, your brother shall rise again. And Martha says, yes, Lord, I know in the last day he's going to rise in glory. No, he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about the miracle right here, right now. Too many times we take the word of God and we put it off to heaven. We put it off. To, and Jesus said, the kingdom of God is now. He says, if I cast out devils by the name of God, then the kingdom of God is now. The kingdom of God is now. We are in the kingdom of God. The law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. So we're under another set of laws. It's the laws of life. So we have a provable, we have an outcome, but we have a time in that outcome. And I don't mean that you have to make God say, look, God, Lord, I need this miracle. By the end of the week, or I'm, or we're through. That's not what we're talking about. But we're talking about seeing something happen. It's not just an open-ended Seeing something happen. All right. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to talk just a little bit about translation. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study to show yourself approved. Now, you know that there are many, 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 many different translations of the Bible. And I just want to give you a real short course on the translations. Because the translations come in three different kinds. Um, and the first is word for word. Word for word translation. The King James Version is a word for word translation. The um, Tyndale Bible, which the King James translators used heavily. That was the one from 1300. That was a word for word. It's a little hard to read because it's word for word. The um, NASB, North American Standard Bible. That is a word for word. What is it? New American Standard Bible. Thank you. The ESV, English Standard Version, and the NET, New English Translation, possibly. Those are all, the NET, I believe, is an online, totally online Bible. But these are all word-for-word -word translations. So word-for-word -word means that they take the Hebrew, translate it into English. They take the Greek, translate it into English. Those are the, the main line word-for-word -word translations. Now, the second kind of a translation is thought-for-thought -thought translation. A thought-for-thought -thought means they don't just take each word and translate it. They take the phrases or the sentence 
and translate it into an English phrase or a sentence. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you must understand that it's not a word for word. Now, generally, I preach from the King James, but uh, I don't usually say it in a King James way. I kind of change it, which, by the way, in case anybody's interested, I, don't, I think some time ago I announced my personal pronouns. You know, for all of you that are aware, my personal pronouns are thee and thou, okay? So just everybody use my personal pronouns, thee and thou. Uh, anyway, the thought for thought translation. Sometimes I use a new living translation. That's a thought for thought translation. Now I use that not in a word, in a word for word way, but it sometimes conveys a concept, in a, in a much easier way to understand. When I study to bring the Word of God, I use an interlinear, which is a Greek with words, English words in it. And sometimes I'll use the interlinear in the, uh, in the Hebrew as well, because I want to see what the word is in the Hebrew and what the word is in the Greek. Many times I can recognize them, many times, most of the time in the Greek, I recognize the words. Sometimes in the Hebrew, I'll recognize the words from modern Hebrew. Um, and Pastor Mary Beth, can, she's, she's much better in Hebrew than I am. But I'll recognize some of the words and I'll have a sense of their meaning um, because of the modern Hebrew. But a thought for thought is the NLT, New Living Translation. Then there's a paraphrase. A paraphrase Again, sometimes I use, I use the good news translation. That's a paraphrase. But listen, the paraphrase, I didn't realize this. The good news translation was not made for North Americans. The good news translation was created for African nations. It was created for nations whose English was not their first language. And so it's in very simple, very easy English. That must be why I like it. It's very simple, very easy English. And the good news translation I sometimes use, that's a paraphrase. So paraphrase, you know how many times I'm saying something and I say, oh, that's not what the word actually says. I'm paraphrasing. That's what a paraphrase is. It's not the literal translation of the word. It's a paraphrase, what it means. Um, like, uh, I, I can't think of any paraphrase, but some, I, just, I just do them naturally. I don't know. And then I'll say, you know, th that's, not, that's not what it literally says. That's what I'm saying it says. And, uh, but the Word of God says to study the Bible. Now, the only way that we can study the Bible and trust it is if we truly believe that it is accurate. We believe that it is not only accurate, but meaningful to us. I, I know I give this all the time, but I'll, I'll give it again tonight. And it has to do with the accuracy of the Bible and archaeology. Now, by the way, archaeology over and over and over and over we don't find anything contrary to the Bible. Everything is in agreement with the Bible. I was talking to someone the other day, telling them about the various seal impressions that we found. And um, many of them, for example, uh, if you read the book of Jeremiah, you'll see that Jeremiah had a secretary whose name was Baruch, and we have found his seal impression. In Jerusalem, it says Baruch, uh, secretary to Jeremiah, or something like that. But it, it actually, we know it's his. Um, we found seal impressions from King Hezekiah. We found seal, seal impressions from various notable people. I think there are like 70-some people in the Bible that we have identified through archaeology. And it, there are many, many, many other things. Well, the one thing that, uh, that points to the Word of God is the Dead Sea Scrolls. Dead Sea Scrolls <clears throat> discovered in 1946, 47, 48. They're still discovering scrolls in caves uh, as they explore all these caves. The Dead Sea Scrolls were written by the Essenes. The Essenes were one of the groups, um, along with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees controlled the temple. They controlled the high priesthood. Uh, Sadducee comes from the word Zadok. Zadok was the high priest uh, at the temple, under the, under the temple of Solomon. He was the high priest. So Zadok, that name, comes down to us as Sadducees. And so they were the priest in the temple. The Pharisees, they were adhering to the oral law. Along with having the Tanakh, the written Bible, Hebrew Bible, there was also a collection of oral law. And they adhered to the oral law. And they would always interpret by the oral law, what was, was spoken but not written down. The Pharisees, uh, you know, Jesus clashed with the Pharisees all the time, and the Sadducees. Now, prior to Jesus, 200 years before him, the Essenes clashed with the Pharisees and with the Sadducees. The clash was because 
The Essenes believed they had polluted Jerusalem and polluted the temple. So they moved, the, all of them left Jerusalem, the Essenes, and went out into the wilderness away from Jerusalem because they considered the wilderness a pristine area. They settled in a place called Qumran and they, they set themselves to writing. They were writing copies of the manuscripts of the Bible, the Old Testament, because this is 200 years before Jesus. And also, there are a lot of their writings have to do with their own sectarian um, rules and regulations. They had a lot of those. They are very interesting people because many of their thoughts actually precede what we believe. But there's no connection. There's never been any connection proven between any of the characters of the New Testament, John the Baptist, for example, no, no proven connection. However, the Essenes believed uh, in taking the step of immersion in water a step further. You know, when they immerse in water in, the Jew, in Judaism, it's the mikvah, it's for ritual cleansing. And you have to be ritually cleansed if you've touched certain things or done certain things. Well, they believed that if you wanted to join their sect, there was a major cleansing that would take place as you're welcomed in and it, you would begin a new life. You would wash away your past. This is what they thought. Now, John was not saying that and he was not a part of that. John was saying to repent of your sin and be cleansed. So, but there's a, there's a connection. The other connection was that everybody believed that the temple in Jerusalem was the residence of Almighty God, that his presence was there. The Essenes believing that the temple was polluted, they believed that the presence of God is where the people of God are, just like we believe today. Where two or three gather in my name, I am there, is what he tells us. So, very interesting forerunners, but not, they weren't Christian, and there's no connection that we know of. However, in writing, in discovering these Dead Sea Scrolls, they've discovered every book of the Bible, not the entire book, fragments of every book of the Bible except the book of Esther. That's the only one not found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But all of the Old Testament, none of the New, because again, the New Testament was 200 years before Jesus, every book of the Old Testament was represented in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that automatically tells us that 200 years before Jesus, they you were using the same Old Testament as we use today. Secondly, the book of Isaiah, the entire book was found the, from start to finish. The entire book of Isaiah in one scroll from 200 B.C. Prior to that, prior to the discovery, the oldest book of Isaiah complete was from about 900 A.D. 900 A.D. So that's a thousand years different. They compared the two and discovered that not a single word is different. Not one word. Now, there were three letters different, but they did not affect the words. So what we're seeing is that the book of Isaiah copied by hand over a thousand years. How many copies do you think were made between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Latin Vulgate? How many copies must there have been? And yet, the word for word was the same. The scripture says that the God watches over his word. He watches over his word. We can trust that the word of God that we are reading today is the word of God as penned by Moses, as penned by Baruch, Jeremiah's scribe, as penned by the various writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all of these people, Peter, James, we can trust that it has been meticulously copied and that it was inspired by the Spirit of God. Not cunningly devised fables. They were reporting the move of God, the miracles of God, the presence of God, the power of God, and how a sinful people can come before a holy God and receive grace and mercy and have new life in Him. And all we need to do is believe and put it into practice in our lives. When we understand our Bibles, we will not just understand it with head knowledge, we'll understand it with heart knowledge. And that's why I put in the application. Because it's not enough to read the Bible, we need to live the Bible, applying it to our lives. When I first gave my life to the Lord in Jerusalem, Israel, living there as an unsaved, wild archaeologist, 
I immediately applied the word of God. Several things. I got rid of all the negative influences in my life. Everything either got flushed down the toilet or thrown in the trash. There were certain people I stopped being around. That was the first start. Then an interesting thing happened to me. I did not hear about this from anybody. I did not attend any and hear any messages on this, but I had an overwhelming desire to take 10% of my savings and give it to the church where I gave my life to the Lord. And I did that. Immediately began living the word of God. I didn't know about tithing yet. I learned about that later. But the spirit of God moved me to give. Let the spirit of God direct and guide us. Let the spirit of God reveal the word of God to us. Jesus said he will show us things to come and he will guide us into all truth. He also said, thy word is truth. So guiding us into all truth will primarily be guiding us into the truth of God's word. What it means, how we apply it, how we prove it and show it to others. So tonight, I, I hope that everybody, both online and here in the sanctuary, will have a greater reverence for the word of God, a greater understanding of the word of God and a greater ability to believe and apply to your lives. Um, if somebody told me that I would believe the Bible years ago, I mean, before I got saved, I, would, I, I mean, I couldn't even read the Bible. You know, I tried, I tried a number of times to read it, just didn't make any sense to me. But after I got saved, I just began reading it every day. And it was the Good News Translation, by the way. And it made absolute sense to me. Reading God's word, applying God's word, living God's word, meditating. And isn't that what the Lord told Joshua? If you want to be successful, if you want to prosper, this book of the law shall not depart from your eyes, but you will meditate therein day and night to observe to do according to all that is written therein. You don't need to go out to the bookstore or go online and buy a prosperity or a success book. It's right here.